Well, I'm glad you have stick with us. Today we will begin talking about why are we in college, okay? Maybe for a lot of you, the fact that you are in college is because you want a better education. You want to do better, you know, and with a better education, you can get, actually get a better job. So let's begin talking about the role that computer science and computer literacy play when you're looking for a job. So I am assuming that you do want a job. So I went ahead and I look around for the best jobs out there in the industry, okay? Now, I am gonna admit that I was biased in here because the first and best job is to be a software developer. Then followed by computer system analyst. Then after that, we have a few other jobs that are not specific to computer science, right? So I omitted those ones. Then in number nine, we have web developer. Skipping a few, then in 11, we have information security analyst. And at number 12, we have the database administrator. So here is the deal, okay? You know those jobs, and of course, you know, for those jobs, you have to not just be computing literate, but you have to actually know a lot more about computers. So you may say, well, you know, yeah, computers are important, but maybe that's not your cup of tea. Okay, that is fine. However, I want you to keep in mind that even if you are not a computer specialist, you will need computers, computing skills in order to go ahead. You know, if you are at, at a particular level in your workplace, probably knowing more about technology and being well versed on whatever technology they use at your workplace is going to give you a raise. So think of that and be happy about learning about computer science. Let's continue. So let's talk about information technology. A lot of people actually go to work in information technology, but what what is there? What happens in information technology? Well, information technology is anything that has to do with information. We're going to define information in a little bit. You, you may have an idea of what information is, but we'll talk about that. We're going to talk about why it's generated, managed, and distributed. Second thing, you know, information technology also relates to the equipment used to process that information. You know, the data, the information, everything that goes around the equipment that houses everything that we, that we work with. Third, we have telecommunication systems, okay? That is how we connect equipment with other equipment and how we connect them so that we can have access to information, not just locally, but from far away. We also talk about software use, and that includes installing, maintaining, and, uh, and uh, more than anything, I want you to think of maintenance. Okay, so anything to do with technology falls into information technology. So if you work for a big company, you may have an information technology department, right? So anything that has to do with information will go in there. So there is things that you can actually hold and touch, such as equipment, right? If you want, you could become an, a specialist on working only with the equipment part. If you are a software developer, then you will work with the software developer part, right? The software use and, and installation and maintenance as well, right? Another thing is if you are a networking specialist, which is yet another area of computer science, then you will work with the con connectivity and putting um, you know, equipment together and also very important to make sure that whatever information and whatever equipment you have is safe and is secured from hackers, okay? So let's move on. So I told you that I was going to define information. So let's begin talking about data. Okay, data, for example, may be a number or a word. Okay, something that has absolutely nothing else but just a number. For example, data can be nine. Data can be hello. Okay, that is data. Then we have information. Information is when we grab that data and we actually organize it in a way that actually means something. So let me go and give you an example. For example, let's talk about data. Let's look at the letter A. A is data, but the letter A doesn't really tell me much. I could interpret the A if, we, if I transfer it to make it, I process it so that it's information, the A could mean uh, A blood type. For example, 
the A blood type. A could mean the grade that you hopefully will get in the class. That's another way of seeing A. And A could be your middle initial, somebody's middle initial, or A could be just the very first letter of the alphabet. You see, when we had A by itself, it was just data and it didn't really meant much, okay? It's just a number. However, once I, I process that and I convert it into information, now it has a meaning. Another example, for example, the number 23. Okay, 23, what can that be? 23 cows, what's, what's the deal, right? 23, again, is data. But when you think of 23-year-old person, you know that that person is an adult and a whole lot of things uh, other things come up, right? For example, if somebody tells you, hey, you know, 23, wow, that's my number because I had 23 surgeries last year. You're like, wow, so that, that gets yet another meaning. For example, you can say, oh, that kid, that kid's weigh 23 pounds. You know, that is another kind of information. So, or somebody comes and tells you, hey, you know, I had 23 children in my last marriage. You're gonna be like, whoa. So you see, the number 23 in itself as data doesn't really give you much. But once you process it and put it together with other data, it becomes information. And that is what we guard, we keep, we maintain, and we process, okay? Let's continue. So I tell you that we process that. So how do we process the information? Well, first of all, we have the input. That's whatever we put into our computer. Then we actually have the process. Now, the input is the data as we talk about. Then the process is whatever is gonna get that input converted into information, and it's gonna actually produce the output. So we input data and we output information. However, there is another extra thing that you have to consider, and that is storage. Because not everything can be processed and kept in memory or can be real time, we actually need to store that part. Storage is necessary because if you don't store something, let's say you have your, um, just imagine this, imagine your computer without storage, meaning that you cannot save any documents, that you don't have any flash drives to save anything. You cannot save anything. Whatever you have must be in memory, must be running, and if there is a power outage and you don't have a laptop but a desktop, the information is gone. So you were writing a term paper, you had no way to save it, and uh, how are you gonna show it to your teacher? Maybe you can print it, but once it's printed, if you turn the computer off, it's gone. So storage is really, really important, mostly considering the massive amounts of information that we have. So let's continue looking at the information processing cycle. So if we uh, think of it, you know, we have the input, that is the data that goes into the computer. Now this is specific. The process is the one that will convert the data into information, as I mentioned. Then we have the output, which displays the information from the user. That's what I, the user actually sees. And it's important that when it's displayed, it's displayed properly. Otherwise, we're like, oh, what? I don't understand what it's being displayed here. And that's when we complain about bad user interfaces, when we cannot find a button or something, you know? Then we have the storage that saves the data and information for later use. Okay, so all of this takes place using software. Software basically drives everything, okay? So it, it involves the whole process from input to output. A software allows you to read something, allows you to process it and prints it out or saves it to storage or outputs it to the screen, right? So there is many ways in which we could see software, but mainly I'm gonna to talk to you about two kinds of software. First of all, we have application software. And within this, I will tell you about productivity software. That is something that you will actually use in school. Productivity software, just like the name says, makes you more productive, okay? So productivity software is probably what you're using to do the homework for this class or for any other class because you may have to write an essay, you may use Microsoft Word, you may need to process a spreadsheet and you will use uh, Excel and all that kind of software is productivity software, okay? Notice that in that sense, you can also think of software that actually wastes your time, right? But in this case, I'm not even gonna touch that one. Let's continue with software. 
So as I was mentioning, we have the productivity software. Now, we have another kind of software in here. We have the system software. And part of the system software is the operating system. And two examples of that are Windows and OS X for the Macintosh. This kind of software usually comes installed and people tend to ignore it because they are like, oh, I have a PC, oh, I have a Mac, or I have a Linux box. But in reality, somebody actually programmed it program that and somebody took the care of putting it, installing it in your, in your computer. So you have to always consider that it is there for a reason and you could actually be part of building that kind of software. That is something that you can actually do. Let's continue. So who owns the software? You get the computer, the software is in there. Who owns that software? Well, let me talk about proprietary software is software that somebody developed, let's say Microsoft, okay? You buy it, quote unquote, and you can use it, but it's not really yours, okay? On the other hand, we have the open source software, which you don't really buy, you can just download. Somebody made it for free, but guess what? You don't own it either, okay? So what is the difference? Well, with proprietary software, the software you buy, you own, you, you, you own the license to use it, and you cannot really modify it. You're at their mercy if there is an update or something, you better do it, and you're working with them. In regards to the open, open source, if you're a programmer, you can actually make it do whatever you want. So there is an advantage. In both cases, you don't really own it. But in one, you're paying for it, and the other one, you're not. In one, you depend on people when, you, when it's proprietary, and in the other one, you don't. So what else can you do? Let's take a look at that. Aside from that, we have software as a service, right? And this is software that is actually residing online and you can access it over the internet. A very good example of this is Google Docs, okay? We will talk about that during the class and you will learn much more about it. Okay, so let's continue on with my colleagues which will be talking about other kinds of software for you. Thank you.